A1, the hits. Hello, and welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ana Mateo. This program is for English learners, so we speak a bit slower. And our stories are written especially for people learning English. The U.S. government may have rejected visas for about 500 Chinese students this school year because of a policy from the administration of President Donald Trump. The policy is supposed to prevent Chinese students. From stealing American technology and giving it to the Chinese military. Wang Zhiwei is a 23 year old finance student at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Wang was hoping to come back to school in America after attending video classes at home in China. However, He said the U.S. Embassy took away his student visa this year. The whole thing is nonsense, Wang said. What do we finance students have to do with the military? He asked. The students are not the only ones who say they are affected. Businesses and other individuals say the policy affects their plans. The policy is supposed to keep people who are connected to the Chinese Communist Party, the People's Liberation Army, or universities that work on military projects from coming to the United States. U.S. officials say thousands of students and researchers are connected with Chinese government programs. These programs ask students to take medical, computer, and other technical information to China. A 2020 report from the U.S. State Department said the Chinese government exploits private businesses, researchers, and students so it can build its military. The State Department said the Chinese government has a plan for civil military fusion. That means it treats private businesses and universities as partners that will help China develop new technologies. Chinese officials asked Wendy Sherman, the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, to drop the visa restrictions. When she visited in July, President Joe Biden has not talked about the problem. The U.S. Embassy in Beijing told the Associated Press that the policy is necessary to protect U.S. national security interests. It also noted that although there are 500 students who are upset, The U.S. did approve 85,000 others. The embassy added the United States stands ready to issue visas to all those who are qualified. Wang, who would only give his family name, said he was denied a visa when he wanted to go with his wife to California, where she is studying childhood cancer. He is an engineer with a company that makes aircraft in China. Chinese news reports said people like Huang are denied because they went to Chinese schools connected with the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology. I was insulted, Huang said. Huang said his wife was supposed to study in California. For three years, but she will reduce her trip to one year because she cannot be away from her family for so long. The U.S. also sent three students home to China 
in August, after they arrived at the Houston airport, agents found military training photos on their phones. A foreign ministry spokesperson said the Chinese government deplores and rejects the U.S. policy. Lawyers who say they are working with a group of 2,000 students said they plan to ask the U.S. to remove the restrictions or change them so more students can come. Before studying in St. Louis, Wang Zhiwei graduated from the Beijing Institute of Technology, another university whose students are being rejected. There are a number of other Chinese universities whose graduates said the U.S. is blocking them. Many said they cannot continue their studies without coming to the U.S. this year because their classes are no longer available online. Kurt Dirks is an administrator at Washington University. He said the policy affected only a few students. He said they can start school using their computer or wait to come to school next year. He said the university will help them keep up with their studies. Monica Ma is a 23-year-old information management student from China. She spent a year studying in Australia after completing her studies at the Beijing University of Posts and Telecommunications. She is supposed to attend Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania right now, but the U.S. rejected her visa request. She has a job offer, but cannot accept until she completes her degree. She said she will wait until next year. Maybe, she said, she will get a visa then. Another student, Li Chuan Yi, is supposed to be in New York City at Columbia University. Li is now in Hong Kong. He said he will not come to the U.S. even if the rule changes. The United States rejected me, and I am not going. I'm Dan Friedel. Thanks, Dan. Now, let's hear from Jonathan Evans with this story from Singapore. Scientists at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore have found a new way to handle food waste. They are turning unused durian fruit coverings, or husks, into antibacterial bandages. The researchers took fibers from the fruit's husks after they were cut and dried. Then they mixed the fibers with a liquid called glycerol. This mixture becomes a soft substance called a hydrogel, which is then made into bandages. The fruit's husks make up more than half of a durian's structure. They are usually thrown away and burned, which adds to environmental waste. William Chen is director of the Food Science and Technology Program at NTU. He said, In Singapore, we consume about 12 million durians a year. So besides the flesh, we can't do much about the husk and the seeds, and this causes environmental pollution. Chen added that the technology can also turn other food waste, such as soybeans and grains, into hydrogel. The hydrogel bandages can keep wound areas cooler and more moist than normal bandages, which can help speed up healing. The researchers say using waste materials and yeast for the antibacterial bandages is less costly than using normal bandages. 
The antibacterial substances in those bandages use more costly metallic compounds like silver or copper. Fruit seller Tang Enchuan said he goes through as much as 1,800 kilograms of durian each day during durian season. He said being able to use the parts of the fruit that are usually thrown away would make enjoying durian, in his words, more sustainable. I'm Jonathan Evans. Thanks. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Today, we talk about burning and the effects of extreme heat. There is a special word for this. Scorch is a damaged area or mark that is caused by burning. Scorch is also a verb. When we scorch something, we burn it. But scorch sounds more serious than a burn. For example, I would not say I scorched dinner. I would say I burned it. Sometimes we use it to describe a verb meaning to produce extreme heat. For example, the sun scorched the bare earth. And that brings us to today's expression, scorched earth. Scorched earth describes a kind of policy or way of doing something. For example, it is a kind of military policy. This policy makes sure that all resources, houses, food crops, factories, vehicles, are destroyed before an enemy can use them. You destroy all things of value so that they cannot be used against you. A scorched earth approach is also used in the world of business. It is similar to the military policy. A scorched earth approach is when a company gets rid of the best parts of its business during a hostile takeover. This is to make it less appealing to another company that might want to buy it. In both military and business, a scorched earth approach is often a last ditch effort. We turn to a last ditch effort when everything else has failed. Everything. Once everything is destroyed, there is no going back. It is a point of no return. Burning bridges is a related expression. We wrote about this in an earlier Words in Their Stories. This expression is often used in personal relationships. If you burn your bridges, you destroy your relationships. Again, there is no going back and saying you are sorry. However, when you burn bridges, relationships with others is the only thing you are destroying. So these two expressions, burning bridges and scorched earth, are not interchangeable. But they have a similar goal, destruction. Let's say a friend of mine, Georgina, was a talent agent. She represented many successful writers, artists, and musicians in a large city. When the business got too big, she opened an agency with her friend Stephanie. They grew the company, and it was very profitable. Georgina had all the contacts, but Stephanie knew how to oversee a company. Maybe too well. One day, Georgina arrived to the office to find herself locked out. Her friend had tricked her into signing away her rights to the company. Georgina was out. 
she found that legally there was nothing she could do. So she did the only thing she could do. She took a scorched earth approach. Georgina knew the most valuable things the company owned were the contacts she had. So she burned all her bridges and destroyed the relationships with all those contacts. It took her a while, but in time, the agency failed. Stephanie is still looking for work, but Georgina moved to a beautiful island and opened a restaurant. And that's all the time we have for this Words in Their s We hear from Mario Ritter. He talks about a new program in the United States that hopes to help children read. A donation by a famous writer has helped start an effort called the United States of Readers to help poor children read more books. The classroom program is being launched by Scholastic Book Clubs with a donation of $1.5 million from the writer James Patterson. Scholastic announced the program recently. It aims to bring books to 32,000 poor children who are in kindergarten to eighth grade. Judy Newman is president of Scholastic Book Clubs. She said in a statement that in many communities, people do not have enough money to buy books. So, she said her company needed to come up with an alternative to our tried and true model, because every child needs to be able to choose and own books and see themselves as a reader. Scholastic is a large publisher of books for children and educational materials. Its goal is to get books into schools to increase literacy. The company has publishing rights in the U.S. for books like the Harry Potter and Hunger Games series. A gift from Patterson helped start the new program. He is credited with selling millions of books. He has already donated more than $10 million to teachers and students through Scholastic. He said in a statement that he has supported literacy for many years. He believes reading skills are important for the country. In many cases, kids simply need access to books, and especially books they want to read, to fall in love with reading, characters, and stories. Patterson added that the program will bring books to those schools and communities that need them the most, and ones that we haven't served before. Scholastic describes the program on its website. It says the United States of Readers program targets children in schools serving poor communities that receive federal educational money. The company said it has chosen a limited number of schools to take part this year, but hopes to expand the program in the coming years. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Thanks, Mario. Finally, our last story comes from Brian Lynn. He talks about malaria and important research happening in Uganda. Researchers in Uganda have discovered evidence of a drug-resistant form of malaria. 
Health officials fear the finding could make the top drug used against the disease useless if the resistant form keeps spreading. Scientists in Uganda examined blood samples from patients treated with artemisinin, the main medicine used for malaria in Africa in combination with other drugs. They found that by 2019, nearly 20% of the samples had genetic changes suggesting the treatment was ineffective. Lab tests showed it took much longer for those patients to get rid of the organisms that cause malaria. Drug-resistant forms of malaria have previously been found in Asia, so health officials were watching for signs in Africa, which makes up more than 90% of the world's malaria cases. Some drug-resistant forms of malaria have also shown up in Rwanda. Our findings suggest a potential risk of cross-border spread across Africa, the researchers wrote in a study recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The scientists examined 240 blood samples over a three-year period. They found evidence that the drug-resistant forms first appeared in Uganda rather than being imported from elsewhere. Malaria is spread by mosquito bites and kills more than 400,000 people every year. Most of the victims are children under age 5 and pregnant women. Dr. Philip Rosenthal is a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. He told the Associated Press that the new findings in Uganda following the past results in Rwanda prove that resistance really now has a foothold in Africa. Rosenthal who was not involved in the new study, said there is likely undiscovered drug resistance elsewhere on the continent. He said drug-resistant versions of malaria appeared in Cambodia years ago and have now spread across Asia. He predicted a similar path for the disease in Africa, with possibly deadlier results because of the heavy presence of malaria in Africa. Dr. Nicholas White is a professor of medicine at Mahidan University in Bangkok, Thailand. He wrote a commentary on the results that appeared with the study. He described the findings about a drug-resistant malaria as unequivocal. Based on the results, White suggested a change in the treatment method for malaria. He said that instead of combining artemisinin with one or two other drugs, doctors should now use three. This method is often used to treat tuberculosis and HIV. White urged public health officials to take steps now to reduce the spread of drug-resistant malaria. Among other measures, he suggested increased monitoring and support for research into new drugs. We shouldn't wait until the fire is burning to do something, he said. But he added that is not what generally happens in global health. As an example, he pointed to recent failures to stop the worldwide spread of COVID-19. 
I'm Brian Lynn. Thanks, Brian. And that's our program for today. Some content in this program was provided by the Associated Press or Reuters News Agency. And don't forget to join us again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Ana Mateo. Thank you.